All right, so we've talked about what proteins look like, and in this chapter we're going to be talking about um, how they actually carry out a specific function. So um, when we talk about functions of proteins, we talk about some proteins that are actually kind of interesting to discuss their function. Um, those would be your globular proteins compared to your uh, uh, structural proteins like your uh, collagen and keratin and everything like that. So your globular proteins hold a number of different functions. They can be involved in the storage of ions and molecules. Um, they can be involved in the transport of ions and molecules. They can serve as defense agents against pathogens. They can be involved with muscle contraction. And they can be involved, uh, or they can be biological catalysts, which that's that's your discussion of enzymes, and that's something that we're going to get into a little bit later on in the semester, but that's like a whole uh, standalone chapter for this, this course altogether. So we're going to get into that a little bit down the road. Now, the first thing that you want to do whenever you're talking about the function of a protein is talk about their interactions with other molecules. First and foremost, that interaction is reversible. This is a transient process with a chemical equilibrium of A plus B yields AB. So we have this equilibrium, A plus B, and in this case, um, a molecule that binds to a protein is called a ligand or a ligand. Um, typically, it's a very small molecule. Now, the, a region of the protein where the ligand binds is called the binding site, the ligand binding site. And these bind via uh, some non-covalent interactions that are going to dictate protein structure. Um, so that is what allows these interactions to be transferred. Now, binding can be quantitated. And one of the ways that you can look at it is you have a protein identified as p right here and a small ligand okay so there is an association constant for these two or for the formation of this pl complex and there is subsequently a dissociation of that pl complex now this interaction can be described quantitatively by the association rate constant k sub a or the dissociation rate constant k sub d okay so we can basically characterize this as K sub A times the concentration of P times the concentration of L, our ligand, protein times our ligand, is equal to K sub D, the protein concentration of our PL complex. So the equilibrium or composition is characterized by the equilibrium association constant K sub A or the equilibrium dissociation constant K sub D. So you can characterize that and rewrite it as K sub A is equal to our product, in this case, our product, protein ligand complex divided by our reactants, protein times our ligand concentration. And that is, well, that's our K sub A, which is the same as one over K sub D. So one of the things that we wanna do whenever we're talking about binding is we wanna determine the fraction of our occupied binding sites. So this would be an instance where maybe a protein has multiple ligand binding sites, but we wanna look at the total number of binding sites and determine the fraction of those total number of binding sites that are um, occupied within a solution. So how would we figure that out? Well, in order to figure that out, we would have to look at the ratio of our PL, which is our protein ligand complex, divided by our protein ligand complex plus our free protein. Because that free protein, well, let's just look at it like this. Let's say this protein has one ligand site. Well, it's occupied, so that one's checked. So we have a PL complex. And this one right here, we've also got that binding site that's occupied. Here we have, however, our free protein concentration, and that protein has a ligand binding site, but it is unoccupied. So the total number of ligand binding sites is going to be PL, or the concentration of PL, plus the concentration of P, and that is going to be divided by our PL complex. So that's what's going to give us our theta, which is our fraction of occupied binding sites. So I'm gonna erase all of this real quick. Okay, now to come up with the best representation of that theta 
what we can do is manipulate this a little, little bit. So we can look at our association constant k sub a is equal to pl over p times l. Now we can rearrange this by doing some simple algebra to come up with p times l concentration times k sub a is equal to pl. Now that right there gives us something that we can substitute in on the sorry that gives us something that we can substitute in for our pl so we can substitute that that in take this taking that and plugging it in right here likewise we can plug it in right here and so that gives us our terms with respect to concentrations of free protein and concentrations of our ligand okay now that is how we arrive at this right here okay now what we can also do with that is we can take the factor of protein out of the equation so we can manipulate this and eliminate that protein concentration as something that we need to be concerned with and rather what we can do is and we do that by dividing the entire thing by protein concentration and then what we can do is manipulate it so that we end up with this right here so now our theta consideration is equal to concentration of our ligand divided by our ligand plus one over our k sub a and we know that our association constant is equal to one over our dissociation constant therefore our dissociation constant is equal to one over as our association constant in which case we end with this right here our equilibrium dissociation constant gives us theta is equal to concentration of our ligand divided by the concentration of our ligand plus our k sub d now one of the ways that you can kind of visualize that is this graph right here so the fraction of bound sites depends on the free ligand concentration and the k sub d so essentially what this shows you if you look at your y or your y axis this is your percent um, ligand binding sites occupied it's not really a percentage um, it's more of a ratio essentially this would be 100 percent this would be 50 percent and this would be zero percent okay now what this shows us is that if we look at our x-axis our x-axis is ligand concentration as our ligand concentration this is just using arbitrary units we don't really care about the units but as our ligand concentration goes up what we see is that our um sorry our ligand concentration goes up moving along the x-axis and then as we move up the y-axis our percent uh, or our our fraction of ligand binding sites that are occupied also goes up now one thing that I'd like you to recognize is that well one this graph is not linear and it does not reach 100% so this is a good representation of what this theta equals ligand over ligand plus KD graph looks like so a great model for a great protein ligand model to discuss and investigate is myoglobin myoglobin is an oxygen binding protein it's a monomer and it binds one single o2 molecule so it is a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of protein to ligand ratio now in order to display that same sort of theta that we just that we talked about previously we can look at theta as um sorry what is displayed there we can kind of use that to look at it in terms of myoglobin and a gas so p sub or po2 is the partial pressure of oxygen which is analogous to the concentration of oxygen p sub 50 is a kind of it is a term that is analogous to our k sub d but it's also or but whenever you're looking at myoglobin you can say it is the point at 50 percent saturation 
And that P50 relates to the concentration of O2. So essentially it's what amount or, or what PO2, what amount of O2, what concentration of O2 gets you to 50% oxygen saturation. So myoglobin serves as a great model in terms of a one-to-one -one ratio and pretty clearly def displaying what you want to see when it comes to a protein-ligand interaction. We're going to investigate that a little bit further over the remainder of the chapter.